Gateway Church, what an honor it is to, uh, to be with you. Uh, I have uh, my wife, she just slipped out to go be with the kids just for a brief moment. She's going to teach them how to, uh, to talk in the, the language, Hindi, and then she's also going to teach them a dance. And uh, so some of you may want to slip out there and, and go to that as well. Um, I know you can get Indian food around here, but to learn how to dance and speak is, it is a whole nother thing. So uh, uh, my wife was also looking around the, the room, and she said, man, this is great. They have all the flags up. And, and she looked, and she looked, and she said, there is no Indian flag up here. And I said, not yet, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, like I said, it is just a, it's honor, and uh, it is exciting. This is such a, uh, so when we first started itinerating, it was 100%, 99% excitement, and 1%, what are we doing? And uh, now that we see the end, and the, the plane tickets are going to be purchased soon, it is like 95%, what are we doing? <laughs> and 5% excited, but we, re- we really are excited. Just the other day, my wife uh, um, she was uh, hanging out with uh, with our uh, the kids' grandma, and um, and they just they you know how girls are and they just started to cry. It was just it was it was a great moment. They had a fun morning, and um, my wife just had the realization that uh, uh, we just won't have those. Um, you know, God bless Skype. You know, we'll we'll be skyping in, but uh, that is something really unique, and we we see that and we sense that that's coming. And uh, as we sang this morning. All of those, all of those, uh, uh, I forget the word that they use, all of those things eclipsed by the glory of God. I said, that is what I'm hanging on to right now. Uh, all, the, all the pain, all the suffering, uh, all, all the comforts that we won't have, all of those things. God, let those things be eclipsed by your glory and uh, by the work that's going to be done over in India. So uh, we're excited to go. We are. We are, but this is a, a different season as we see the end of near. Uh, it's a great privilege to, to bring God's word to you today. And, and uh, if you have your Bibles, would you open up to Mark chapter 1? Um, we'll be taking a look at uh, a few verses here. Mark chapter 1. Jesus heals a man with leprosy, starting in verse 40. Let me read it, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, can you make me clean? Jesus was filled with compassion. He reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. It's like he he text messaged that prayer, you know. (laughs) Immediately, the leprosy left and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See to it that you do not tell anyone, but go. Go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet, the people still came to him everywhere. Father God, this is your word. This is not mine. And Father, the, the, the insights, the things that you have given me are from your throne room. And I just thank you, Lord, that you speak to us through your word. You speak to us through the preached word. And God, I pray that hearts right now, my heart and everyone's heart here, would be open to what you have for us. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The cool thing about this story is that it's not 2,000 years old. It is happening right now. There are places in India where you can go and they have leprosy camps. People still are afflicted by this disease and and they send them off to these camps to get better. Now, the good news is we do have some medicine, but that's also the bad news because so much of this world is dependent now on things that come from this world and not from the power of God. But praise God, they have these places where they can go and and they can get cleansed. And there are Christian people that go to these camps and go and they pray for. My wife and I will have that experience sometime in our first three years in being there and over in India. So this story isn't 2,000 years ago. This story is for us today. 
And this man who comes to Jesus with leprosy, obviously he is diseased. Obviously he is in a tough situation. And it says in verse 41 that Jesus was filled with compassion and then he reached out and touched the man. And I believe that there is a divine order to the way the Holy Spirit placed that verse. He was filled with compassion and then he touched the man. Then he reached out and touched the man. And I saw some of the, and I heard some of the things that Pastor Ben was talking about, some of the outreaches that you have, the food truck and, and all of those sorts of things. And I want you to understand that there is a divine order in which we should minister. And that is that our hearts would be filled with compassion and then we would reach out and touch somebody. I've seen ministry uh, uh, where just people are filled with compassion yet they don't do anything with it. And I read a tweet this morning, and it said, one of the, 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 the ultimate things you can do to be selfish is to die and go to heaven alone. We can have a heart after God, but if we don't do anything with that, then that is selfish. But in the other sense, too, we, we, we can be so caught up in ministry sometimes, right, that, that we do things and we, we leave our heart at home. Or we leave the heart here at the church and we're out on the streets and, and we can be ministering and all that. But if we aren't filled with compassion like Jesus was and then minister, we will miss the divine order that I believe God has intended for all Christians to have when we go out and we spread God's word. So that's, if you're making points, I guess that would be the first point. Be filled with compassion and then reach out and touch somebody. And I love... And I know this is a little bit uh, earlier here. I love the character of God. And sometimes when we read the word of God, we can just read through it. I know, Pastor Ben, you're going through the, the year-long process. One of the things that you can always do in, in, your, in your scripture, in your Bible reading, is just underline or highlight when God reveals his character. I love this. He says, if you are willing, would you cleanse me? In, in, in the Father's heart here through Jesus, I am willing. I'm willing. And I don't know if you're here today and maybe you're going through something, a pain, a trial, a situation. The Father's heart speaks to that, says, I am willing. I'm willing to be a part of that process. I'm willing to get down right where you're at in the trenches, in the hurt, in the pain of a situation. I am willing to be there with you. And, and that's something that you highlight and, and, and you go back to. Maybe you're not going through something right now, but when you do, you can have that highlight in your word and just say, Man, that's the Father's heart for me, to be willing to go through that with me. So we see this amazing story. And I, I understand it's only two verses long, right? And, and, and so he comes to Jesus, he gets healed, and, and hooray, he gets healed, and we all rejoice about that. That's a good thing, right? And, and that's like side A. And there's a whole other story in this story going on. So side A, the, the man with leprosy, he gets healed, and, and, and that's a good thing. We rejoice. But side B, there's another story going on here. And, and it says right here, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. The Holy Spirit decided to use that word, strong warning. Now, I don't understand how Jesus could give you a strong warning, and then immediately you go and do the opposite thing, okay? I don't get that, all right? until I look at my own life, and then I realize, oh, wait, that's me. I do that all the time. Jesus tells me a command, and I go out, and I mess it up, and I thank God for communion in times when we just come to the altar and say, God, I have messed it up again, and the word is grace, grace. God has grace for all of us, and as we'll see at the end of this passage, even when we've messed it up, even when we've, we've, we've just, there's no way to get out of the situation. We've got consequences. We've got problems now. God has grace to supersede all of that. Now he says to the man, be clean. He touches the man and says, be clean. And the first thing that I notice out of that is that he is working with a divine authority. Something that, that supersedes this world. You remember Jesus is in the boat with his disciples, and, and, and what happens? The waves come up, right? And, and, and they all start getting scared, freaking out. And Jesus stands up, <laughs> and he has authority that supersedes the rules, the regulations, the laws of this world. 
And in Acts, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 9, Jesus says to his disciples, let me turn there real quick. Maybe you can just get there faster than I can with your iPad. He says to his disciples in Acts, and I'm sorry, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus called the twelve together and he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God to heal the sick. Jesus has given us the authority to go and to pray for people and to see God work through us to see people healed. And when I look at what, what Jesus is doing here, he is not begging the Father. He's not belaboring in prayer. And Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 5. He is using the divine authority that God has given him to supersede the things of this world. And I would impart that into all of us that are here today, sitting underneath God's word. We have the authority. It has been passed on from Jesus to his disciples to operate in that kind of authority. And if, if we want to see this world come to Christ, if, if we want to see the 300 people groups that surround Jaipur that have never heard the gospel before, we must operate in that authority. Last time I was there, the, the pastor of the church, about 150 people there, said, James, do you want to go out and do some evangelism? And I said, sure, I'd love to. I, and, you know, I'm, I'm planning on moving here, so this, this would be a good thing for me to see how you do it. And he said, okay, let's go. And so we went to this uh, just broken down home, and, and India is obviously known for its poverty. And we walk into this home, we greet them, and, and he, it wasn't very long. He just said, how can I pray for you? And over the next course of minutes, the person just revealed all the things. You know, my uncle's dying, I'm, I'm sick, my children, you know, need a blessing and, and all this sorts of stuff. And he just begins to pray for them, lay hands on them. And with the authority of God, we're crest things from the kingdom, from God's kingdom, to supersede the things of this world. And, and obviously the anointing and the power is there, and, and these people are weeping. And this is the first time that they've had an interaction with God. They have 33 million different idols that they can pray to. But I remember when I was talking to a Hindu man once, he said, James, not one of those idols will ever answer a prayer. I was talking to another Hindu lady, and, and she said, James, I put all my idols in a box because they would never answer my prayers. And I cried out to God. I didn't even know his name. I just cried out to God, said, God, would you reveal yourself to me? And in the course of the situation, it's a, it's a longer story. He did. Because that's the God that we serve. The God that answers prayers. The God that imparts his authority into us. Side B to this whole story. After this man gets cleansed, after he gets healed, he gets sent away with a strong warning. Now you have to understand the heart of the warning is this. See to it that you don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded, this is verse 44, as a testimony to them. A testimony, that's a key word. If, you, if you're taking notes, you want to write that down, testimony. This man that had an interaction with Jesus, Jesus took his test, his trial, his pain, his tough situation, and was transforming it into a testimony. And I can say with complete confidence that although we have a plan and a purpose for our life, Jeremiah 29, 11, although we have individually, God has handcrafted us in the womb, he's knit us together in, his mother's, in our mother's womb, he has put plans and purposes together specific for us. There is also a general plan, a larger plan that we connect into, that our story is a part of, and that's how big our God is. We are a thread in a beautiful tapestry of a story. And, and when we connect that, when we find that, we realize that things that we go through are connected to a much bigger picture. That is exactly what is going on here. His test, his leprosy, his, his loss of a job, his pain, his sickness, his loss of a parent, his wayward child, all of these things now fit into this redemptive story that God is putting together called a testimony. 
and he goes to these priests, and, and we, we, we can understand that more in, in, in greater depth. I'll let Pastor Ben teach on that, about how God was calling the, the religious leaders of Israel back to the original plan which God had for them. And, and you remember when Jesus goes into the temple and he gets so mad, and he's kicking over tables and whipping people and stuff. And, and, um, and then like two chapters later, he's holding babies. I love him. And uh, just, it just blows your mind. And, uh, but he was mad because they had turned the outer court of the temple in, in, into a marketplace. And he said, this house shall be called a house of prayer for how many nations? All nations. God wanted all nations through Israel to know his character, his love, and his story. And, and, and so Jesus is upset that the, the religious leaders haven't gotten it. So he's sending this man that gone through a test with a, now a testimony to be a missionary, a missionary to the religious leaders that they would see that God is on the scene, that he's doing things, that he hasn't left them alone, and that there is a better way to live than the religious lifestyle that they've set up for themselves. So God is using this, and the word for us to hear today as a source of encouragement is this. We're going through tests. And, and you know, you're here. You know if you're going through one or if you've been through one or you can see one on the horizon. You know the challenges that you face. But if we merely allow ourselves to get sucked just into this story and we only look at what we're going through, we may miss the whole point of why we're walking through that test that trial, that pain. We might be actually a part of God's bigger story of using our situation and, and our tough trial and our test into a bigger picture of his testimony to reveal his grace to somebody in our life, in our family, in our, at our workplace, in our home with our children. So as encouragement, know that you are not left by yourself here. God in his His infinite wisdom, infinite wisdom, infinite wisdom has you walking through things, not alone. He's holding your hand because he wants you to be brought into that testimony part of your life where you can be an encouragement. You can be God's grace, his love physically. When you pass out the food, what does Jesus say in Matthew 25? He says, when you do that, you do it, un you do it unto me. You guys are going to be ministering as Jesus would want you to minister with food and clothing and all that. Now, here's the great part of the story. <laughs> Instead, this guy goes out, talks freely, spreading the news, and it says right here, as a result, this is the result of disobedience. Jesus could no longer walk the town openly and stayed outside in only places. Now, this is a tough one, because this, this is for the church. We need to be obedient to Jesus, because it advances the gospel. I'll go to India. That's great. I'll do that. I'm being obedient. Not everybody needs to be obedient. Everybody needs to be obedient. Not everybody needs to go to India. You need to be obedient right where you're at. And if God has you here at this church, and Pastor Ben is leading you the best he can in supporting missions and in, in supporting the, the local church and the outreach and all that stuff, you better be obedient. Because whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter. Your obedience here, right here in this church, has a direct result on the advancement of the gospel throughout the world. I, I, I don't stand on, on some platform, oh, missionary James, I'm just trying to be obedient to what he's called me to do because I know that will advance the gospel. The result here is disobedience hinders the gospel. And that's a tough one because remember at the beginning when I said, I'm that guy. I have disobedience and I need God's grace to cover that. And I need his instruction and his wisdom so I don't mess up again. But the truth of the matter is our hearts need to be filled with compassion and have a strong desire to be obedient to whatever God calls us to do. And then we need to do that faithfully. But here's the good news. Yet people still came to him everywhere. And that's God's grace. 
people still came to him from everywhere because the Father has a heart big enough for this entire world. I think we just hit 7 million people this last year. India is about to surpass China as the most populated country in the world. There are 2,211 identified groups of people in India that have never heard the gospel once in 2,000 years. The next largest country, remember that, 2,200, is Pakistan, which borders India with 400 identified people groups. And, and it's not that we're saying China, you know, don't send missionaries there. Everybody needs Jesus, but we need to be strategic too in how we reach people because the Father's heart is for everyone. And the great news is we're seeing so many awesome things in India. Southern India is almost 30% Christian. If you drew a line right through India, southern India is almost 30% Christian. The second largest church in the world is in southern India. Northern India is less than 1% Christian. But Jesus has a heart for them as well. And he wants this verse to be prophetic over northern India. He wants the people of northern India to be given a chance to come to him. So that's why we're going. But before I close today, and the truth of the matter is that right here and right now, Jesus wants this verse to be prophetic over your life. He wants to give you an opportunity right here and right now for you to come to him. And I, the, the great thing about being a guest is I, I don't know if you've grown up in this church. And I don't care. I don't know if today is your first Sunday or if you've been here a thousand Sundays before. It doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't matter to God. What he wants is your heart. He wants it more than anything. In fact, he would even send his own son to walk this earth and pay the ultimate sacrifice to lay down his life just like our servicemen have done to give you an opportunity right here and right now to give your life to Jesus. You may say, I don't understand what that means. I didn't understand it either. I was 18 years old. I was sitting in a balcony in the church because one of my friends invited me to church for the very first time. I found this old sweater because I figured you probably should dress up to go to church. I was sitting up there And the guy preached his whole sermon. And I didn't hear anything he said, really. The sweater was so itchy around my neck, you know. But it got to the end. And the pastor just said, I'm giving an invitation. You can accept it or reject it. It's your choice. And my heart was beating like a million miles a minute. Tears started coming to my eyes. And was on a hockey team. We, we don't cry. He said if anybody would raise their hand and believe in Jesus today, he would, he would come into your heart. He would change you. And I knew in that moment that I needed to change more than anything else. I was full of pride. I only cared about myself. My family was hurting. And I wasn't a part of the solution. I was the problem. I said, God, I want to change. I don't like who I am. He said, then come. I came down to an altar just like this. Carpet looks the same, actually. And he led me in a prayer. I gave my life to Jesus. What you don't know, church, is that was because one person invited me. Just one. It was the first time I'd ever been invited to church in my whole entire life when I was 18. There's a whole community out there that has never been invited to church. You have that opportunity. But right now, right here, you have the opportunity to receive Christ, to receive his love and his forgiveness, his grace that will supersede anything you've done in your life. I just want to give you the opportunity. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes with me? I'd count it an honor 
to pray with you today to receive Jesus into your life. You might be here today, and, and, and like I said, I don't really care if this is the first time, or you know that right now in this moment, you need to have him again. This might be the first time you've come to church, or you might be growing up in this church, but you're saying right now, James, I need to have a touch from God. He needs to penetrate the hardness of my heart. I want my sins forgiven. I want to be renewed and cleansed just like this man with leprosy was. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, just giving privacy to those. Is there anyone here? I'll look for your hand, but God will see your heart. Is there anyone here? Just by slipping up your hand, say, yes, James, pray for me. I want Jesus in my heart, afresh and anew, or maybe for the first time. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, I don't say that flippantly because you are my Father and you are the God of this universe. Thank you for, for my brother that raised his hand. He's just being honest with you and saying, God, I need you. God, I want to be honest with you. I need you too. We all need you on that level. We all need you to touch our hearts and engage us and to fill us with compassion and, and give us strength to do ministry because if we just leave it up to ourselves, God, we wouldn't do it. So God, would you penetrate our hearts right now? Would you fill us up? Would you wash us of the junk in our life, the sin in our life, the disobedience in our life? God, would you wash it away by your blood? We thank you, God, that you're a God that does that, that you love us so much. God, I thank you for the people in India that have yet to hear of your good news. They don't know of salvation. They don't know of redemption. But they will. In Jesus' name, they will know. Because myself and other missionaries and other people from this church, we're going to go and we're going to tell them the good news of your son, Jesus. And Father, I pray for this church that they would be a sending force of the gospel. And that when they pray, it wouldn't simply just be prayers to, to protect missionary families, but they would be bold prayers that would say, God, give them opportunities today to minister your word to somebody that has never heard it before. Just like Paul prayed in Colossians 3, God, open up the doors that I might reveal the mystery of Christ which is in me to those that have never heard before thank you for today. I thank you. We can honor our, our veterans. We can honor those that are currently serving. Lord, in our military and our missionaries around the world, bless them today. I pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Thanks, James. Why don't we stand this morning and uh, let's just Thank the Lord together for what he's doing in our hearts and the challenge this morning. Uh, just, uh, Lord, we thank you, God, Lord, for, for moments like this, God, where we can slow down and remember, Lord, what you have called us to. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you would just seal these moments in our heart. And, Lord, as we go today, Lord, that you would go before us, behind us, and all around us. And we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. I encourage you to stop by the table, see James and Sarah, grab a prayer card. Let's pray. But go in the grace of God. Enjoy your families. We love you, and we'll see you next week here at the Gateway Church. We love you. Bye-bye.